questions without notice. Are there any questions? The honourable member for Wentworth. Mr Speaker, I move that so much of the standing and sessional orders be suspended as would prevent the Treasurer following the widespread acceptance of the Coalition's detailed economic action plan, forthwith making a statement giving a detailed account of 1. The government's policy to provide tax relief for families. 2. The government's policy to reform the tax system to restore incentive and encourage investment. 3. The government's policy to fund tax cuts by expenditure restraint. 4. The government's policy on, on which areas of expenditure will be cut. 5. The government's policy to hand back the proceeds of bracket creep to average Australian taxpayers. 6. The government's policy in respect to the size of future budget surpluses. 7. The government's policy to privatise a wide range of government business enterprises. 8. The government's policy to eliminate the cost disadvantages that stem from the abysmal productivity Order. performance and, ineff and inefficient work and management practices on our waterfront. 9. The government's policy to inject foreign competition into coastal shipping. 10. The government's policy to deregulate and increase the competitiveness of our domestic transportation and communication industries. 11. The government's policy to move wages growth more in line with productivity so as to eliminate our significant labour cost disadvantage when compared to our trading partners. 12. The government's policy in respect to the independence of the Reserve Bank to ensure that the bank actually meets its charter of controlling inflation. 13. The government's policy to lower the rate of inflation to at least that of our trading partners by the uh, end of the next Order. parliamentary term. 14. The government's policy to achieve a significant and sustainable reduction in interest rates by the end of the next parliamentary term. And 15. The government's policy to reduce our current account deficit and bring the growth of our foreign debt under control by the end of the next parliamentary term. Mr Speaker, Mr. Speaker, this motion is a matter of great urgency. As members of this parliament, as members of this parliament and most Australians are beginning to realise Australia is on the brink of an economic crisis. This week we will confirm that our fundamental economic position is deteriorating just at a time when the world is becoming more concerned about excessive levels of debt and about the capacity of nations to pay. Australia desperately needs strong economic leadership. We need a Treasurer who knows what he's doing and who can identify what needs to be done and act quickly and decisively to put things right. Yet it is weekend television performances and again last night at the MTIA dinner we observed a tragic figure. We observed a man who was blundered in battle through his carelessness, a poor strategy, and now realises he faces defeat. We observed a man who has fired his best shots and realises his policy arsenal is empty. We observed a man who believed he had earned the right to govern through hard work and daring, but finds that past misjudgments now leave him condemned. We observed a man losing support even amongst his supporters in his own party as they see his, his uh, weaknesses starkly revealed. And finally, we observe a man who is left to moan and mutter cliches and to curse his foes because he realises he cannot deliver new policy initiatives. We observe a lonely, a tortured, a humiliated figure. And as his empire, and as his empire crumbles Order. around him, as his empire Order. crumbles around him and only, with only about four months away, the Treasurer last Order. weekend simply told the Australian people that the government will, and I quote, reserve the right to put a proposal about how it sees Australia in the next, next three years. Reserve the right to put a proposal. No policies. This is the man who has demanded detailed policies from the opposition over a period of weeks. This is the man whose demands have been met by the most detailed set of economic policies ever put down in the history of this country. And yet he refuses. He refuses to disclose his own hand. He, 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 he refuses to tell us how he would get us out of the mess he has created. That simply isn't good enough. The Australian public deserves to know and they need to know what his policies are. And of course he has absolutely an abysmal track record when it comes to economic forecasting. People are now, the Australian people are now becoming concerned that this man is a loose cannon on our economic deck. The fact is he's lost all his economic credibility. His forecasts are continuously astray. He's only achieved his inflation forecast once in the life of this government. Last year's current account outcome was nearly double that of the forecast number. But of course he proudly proclaims, don't hold me accountable for those forecasts. Look at the budget outcomes over which we have some control. 
Well, if this is so, and if we look at his budget outcomes, we could refer him to the fact that although the aggregate number came out OK last year, there were some substantial errors and variations in individual programs, and he should be held totally accountable for those. We're also in a situation where when one looks at the forward estimates released in the last budget, we see a variation in those forward estimates for 89-90 of between, um, <coughs> between November 88 and the budget, a massive hole in his own figuring of $1.8 billion, simply got because of his ignorance, his inability to forecast, predominantly $1.6 billion was accounted for by errors in forecasting that underlie those budget numbers, a $1.8 billion hole. And in other words, how is it that the Australian population is to have any confidence in this man's ability to forecast uh, the Australian economy. And what does he say? He reserves the right to put down his policies. Well, he has no policies. He has no policies in any of the areas to which he's referred. He likes, for example, to make a big issue of his fiscal policy performance. He says he's tough, but the fact is he's actually been easing fiscal policy over the last 18 months. He says last night he won't hesitate to increase the surplus next year. He's just reduced it by $5 billion this year by those unfunded tax cuts, and he's already hinting, at the already hinting at the possibility of further tax cuts next year. He says there's no scope for further expenditure restraint, and yet his own document, which claims to have costed our proposals, identified that about 20 per cent of those who are long-term unemployed shouldn't get benefits. Well, why do you continue to fund them? if that is the case. There's plenty of scope for cunning government expenditure, as we have demonstrated. Moreover, since the budget, he's increased expenditure by over $500 million. Nothing's gone through the parliament about this, but a substantial blowout in expenditure. A couple of hundred million dollars for his mates in the airlines, 200 to $250 million for the banks, the big four banks, just to hold down some mortgage rates, $60 million to uh, Kodak uh, in that notable marginal seat of wills, an undisclosed amount to Australian Airlines in support of their payouts in the current pilots dispute, $150 million to waterside workers, and Taz Bull tells us the next morning there are no guarantees of productivity improvement, $150 million out the door, five or $600 million out the door, totally unaccounted for. He, uh, he also promises, as I say, the suggestion of tax cuts. How is he going to pay for them? Is he not going to cut expenditure? He's going to rely on bracket creep. He will not give bracket creep back. He has no concept of tax relief for families. Indeed, he hints, he hints last night that the ACTU may not support it. The interesting question, does Bill, Bill Keldy uh, oppose rebates for childcare? Does Bill Keldy oppose tax rebates for children? Let's see whether the ACTU opposes those, uh, those initiatives. Similarly, he has no proposals for tax reform. He has no concept of a simpler, flatter, two-tier tax system that is fundamentally es essential to getting incentive and productivity into this country. Last night he boasted he was upping the ante on fiscal policy. So much for upping the ante on fiscal policy. Paul, as I said the other day, ours is bigger than yours. You set the criteria. You set the criteria for the size of fiscal policy. You set the criteria. You talk about outlays to GDP. Order. Our outlays to GDP are lower than yours. Our outlays to GDP are 22.5 per cent, the lowest level for 25 years. We've also got the lowest tax burden in six years and the largest surplus and the largest public sector borrowing requirement on record, $6 billion in current markets in favourable terms. When we turn to monetary policy, he has no monetary policy either, no concept of monetary policy. He doesn't believe in an independent reserve bank. He believes in total dominance of the reserve bank. He doesn't believe in medium-term economic management through the Reserve Bank. He believes in day-to-day -day crisis management bent around his uh, particular desires for elections. He doesn't believe, and I should say he doesn't understand, monetary policy and how to use it and how to run it. He prefers to do deals. He prefers to uh, prevent the Reserve Bank from performing the tasks that are required for it to achieve its tarter, charter. He has actually no, absolutely no answer on uh, inflation. He cannot lower inflation. We can. He cannot lower interest rates. We can. He cannot cut government expenditure. We can. He cannot uh, hand back bracket creep. We can. 
He cannot uh, fund tax cuts. We can. He cannot privatise. He cannot clean up the waterfront. He cannot inject foreign competition into coastal shipping. He cannot boost production and productivity. He cannot reverse the declining living standards. Order. We can and we will. Yeah. Order. Is, is the motion seconded? The second Honourable the Leader of the Speaker. National Party. Order. Order. Members on my right. Order. The Honourable Leader of the National Party. Thank, thank you, Mr Speaker. This motion is an opportunity for the government to put up or to shut up. Yeah. Because for, for months now, for months now, we've had the Treasurer and the Prime Minister and other ministers there saying, where is your policy? And we put the policy on the table. And what they had, when they were calling for our policy, we had this mindless chanting from the back bench. Absolutely mindless chanting, where's the policy? Well, the policy is now on the table, and we're waiting for the response from the government. And the opportunity is now, Mr. Speaker, for this government that claims to have a direction, Remember that, for that claims to have some answer for Australia's problems, to put its answers on the ta table at the present time. Because what we've got from them is nothing short of policy paralysis, Mr. Speaker. There is an absolute. Look, look what we've got over here the Minister for Social Security. Who, who came in and attacked, attacked the opposition, attacked the opposition for supporting families? Well, what's your answer? What are you going to do for families in Australia? What's your, what's your policy on the dependent Order. spouse rebate? What are you going to do? What are you going to do to rate, to provide tax credits for children? And what about childcare? How is this government going to address the question of childcare? You don't have any answers to it. Oh. But when it, when it comes to Order. the treasurer, when it order! 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 The Honourable Leader of the National Party. Thank you, Mr Speaker. And when it, when it comes to the Treasurer, the poor man is totally confused. We saw him on the television at the weekend hinting at tax cuts. Last night he said we're going to increase the surplus, but no suggestion as to whether it's going to be more expenditure cuts, having ruled that out previously, or whether he's perhaps going to do that by increasing the tax grab again and live up to his uh, nickname of bracket creep. Mr Speaker, what is important and what the Australian people want are answers from this government. They want to know what the tax policy of this government will be, what its rates will be going into the next election, what assistance they're going to provide for families. Of course, they also want to know what happened to that famous promise made in, in 1987 of microeconomic reform. Mr Speaker, remember, remember the slogan of 1987, let's see it through. Well, let's see it through. Where is the policy? What are you going to deliver? Put it on the table now. We would really like to see it, and so would the Australian people. And they're going to ask you increasingly what your policy is before the next election. And the reality is, unless you put something on the table, you're going to be tossed out without question. At least give yourself the opportunity to provide some sort of competition at this next election, instead of being slaughtered as you will be at the present time. Tell us what you're going to do about privatisation. And while you're doing that, tell us how you're going to solve the airline dispute. It's been going now for 11 weeks. Remember the Prime Minister said he didn't deserve, he didn't deserve to be Prime Minister of this country if he couldn't solve it. Well, he hasn't solved it. And the best estimate is that it won't be solved, won't be solved until Easter of next year at the best. And tell me, how are you going to call an election with no aviation industry in this country? Has the backbench thought about that? Just how are you going to campaign when there are no aircraft flying in this country? And if, you, if you're a marginal seat holder in North Queensland, you better ring up and see what your superannuation payout is now, because you will be tossed out totally and absolutely. Now, what about the waterfront? What are you going to do about the waterfront? What conversation have you had with Taz Bull? How are you going to deliver? What value is the Australian taxpayer going to get for that $150 million? And when it comes to coastal shipping, has anybody on that side of the parliament thought about the issues? The Minister for Transport obviously hasn't. What about the Treasurer? What about the backbench committee? What is the policy on coastal shipping? And when it comes to resource development, the Minister over here is the ultimate failure totally wiped out. What an irrational, irresponsible decision we saw from this government on Coronation Hill. Why? Because sheer panic, sheer panic set in. Anything to buy Order. a vote, anything to buy a vote. Take any decision you can possibly do to, to gather together some coalition 
of support because you know that mainstream Australia has rejected you. And then do a deal with the Prime Minister so that the Minister can come back here and pretend to be outraged at the decision and get wrapped over the knuckles with a feather duster. Well, so much for principle and so much for credibility. You're a laughing stock in the industry and you know what damage you've allowed to be done to the Australian economy. And tell me, Mr. Mr. Minister, how are you going to cover our foreign debt situation Order. when you won't? Order. You won't the Honourable Member's time has expired. The question is that the motion be agreed to. This is Treasurer speaking to the... Uh, Mr. Uh, the Honourable the Treasurer. Mr. Mr. Speaker, Order. What, a, what a lightweight performer from a couple of consummate lightweights. From a couple of consummate lightweights. Order. You all sat there last night while I reamed you out point by point. <laughs> reamed you out. You were sitting up there. Order. Your old bow ties. The steam was coming up when you sat before an industry group as I took you through the absolute stupidity of your policy positions and against the history of the changes. And why do you think almost to a person, every business person in the place knew everything I said was dead right? Dead right. Order. I know what an absolute joke of a party you are. What an absolute joke of a party you are. And there we have, let's see, you can see how edgy and how flaky the shadow treasurer is. Last night he got reamed out over there. Today he's up here putting on this act. Last week he's attacking journalists personally, calling them Pavlov's dogs. He's attacking journalists, saying they're going to get them when he gets into office and they'll cut them off from all information. This is the sort of little boy stamp your feet stuff you get, you get from a financial market yuppie when you shoehorn him into parliament. <laughs> this is the sort of stuff when you get for someone unfitted unfitted for a major public office job and who is shoehorned onto the front bench because of an absolute absence of talent, an absolute absence of talent, who comes in here, who at best was a st second stringer in the financial markets, wouldn't be good enough to make the A grade, a second stringer in the financial markets, who gets a bit of a bashing. Actually, you got a reasonable reception to your policy on day one from the press, but no, on the end of day one, who's up there attacking journalists and being entirely flaky and edgy? You guessed it, the edgy, flaky member for Wentworth, the shadow treasurer, who's up here today. And he's up here talking about his policy and what, how we should the respond. Flinders. Here's a government that's carried the burden of change in the post-war years from you indolent, useless liberals, you indolent, useless liberals, and what you've got, you've got a policy to throw two and a half billion away in tax expenditures, and you think it, it's going to cover you in some sort of glory. We waited two and a half years for you to bring down a tax policy. There's no rates, not one specification of rates. We still don't know whether the rate will be 39 per cent, when, what the bottom rates will be, nothing. All we've got is the usual the Liberals doing their usual thing trying to buy votes for an election. In your, in your conservatism, last time it was John Howard with, with $7.8 billion worth of bribes. This time you've had the decency to cut that in half. You're now down to about $3 billion worth of bribes. And then, and then you've got, he's got the hide to say our fiscal policy will be 22 per cent of outlays. That's like us. We end up with this enormous level of government spending, 30.7 per cent of GDP. We finally rebuild the building, a proper building, and then it's like building the Empire State Building and this joker jumping in the lift, going to the top and putting a brick on top <laughs> and saying, look what we've done, ours is bigger. <laughs> ours is bigger, you mug, you mug. That, and Order, Mr. the Deputy Treasurer Speaker, might withdraw that remark. I withdraw, Mr Deputy Speaker. And then we get down to the the real recital, the fan, but I mean the height of them, his 22 per cent of outlays, and they've attacked and ripped and torn at every spending decision the government's made for seven years. My colleagues and I, who sit on the front bench, five of us, who sat there for three months a year, twice a year, for seven years cutting outlays, it's now his. He's expropriated it because he's going to add, add 140 million, he says, to a budget of 90,000 million. I mean, the pathetic, the pathetic quality of that remark. I mean, the shame, the shame of it all. I mean, you just should. Look, the thing about you lot, you've just got no shame. Maybe you're just a breed. You're just a breed. When you pop into this world, you're born with no shame. 
you know, maybe you're just a breed. Oh, Mr no. Deputy Speaker, but then, but then on the real issue of the current account, you read all this, and the big problem is the current account deficit. Order. The real problem is the current account deficit and, and debt and inflation. But what's the solution? To give away two and a half billion dollars worth of tax expenditures. That's it. I mean, and spend it. Yeah, cut it and spend it. I mean, that's the solution. I mean, it's it's unbelievable. But as I said last night, the real the real Lulu in the whole thing, the key line is the third last paragraph on page 22. By reducing inflation and shifting the weight off monetary policy, the lower interest rates. That is, we will have lower inflation, but in the company of lower interest rates. Now, this would be a world first. They're actually going to have inflation lower without the help of interest rates, because interest rates will be lower too. And they'll get inflation lower by having enterprise bargaining. Well, I mean, there wouldn't be an economist, an economic institute, the OECD, the IMF. Nobody would regard that statement seriously. They regard that as a joke. And to think that you, as a party, an alternative party of government, professing some capacity, would come along and put a piece of rubbish, an absolute piece of nonsense like that, into a policy that we're, you're going to deregulate the Member labour market, then all of a sudden there's going to be the great leap down in wages. Growth's going to go on, but wages are going to leap down. I mean, it's just unbelievable trite nonsense. Order. Just trite nonsense. I mean, you wouldn't have a wages policy. You heard what the MTIA said to you last night. They don't want any toe-to-toe -to -toe contests. They want a mature industrial structure, an arbitration commission presiding over gradual change that can be afforded. You, you heard what they had to say, the people in the real world, to all of you. They dumped on you. That's what they did, dumped on you. And I know you're all whinging about the reception you got there last night. The fact of the matter is, I mean, you went to an industry group and they dumped on you and you, you cried like stuck pigs all night because you thought it was a Labor audience. You thought it was a Labor group. I mean, you are pathetic because here you are, you're facing an industry group and what do they do with you? They want to deal with you. And finally, of course, when, when you really get down to it, you produce your policy, you sat there for months going over it, and what's the finance department say? It's got an $800 million error in it. An $800 million error. That is, the, the, two, the two departments administering these programs, the Department of Social Security, well, just hang on, the Department of Order. Social Security and the Department of Finance, that's the, that's the department delivering the programs and the one monitoring them, they go through it and say it's got an $800 million error. Now, we all know it was about 1,000 or 1,100 million in reality. In other words, you got into Howard and, and, and the member for McKellar because he had a 19 per cent error in the policy. But, but Stone and Professor Hughes and the rest of them drop up with a 31 per cent error. I mean, you couldn't even get that much right. And then, of course, then yesterday, yesterday we really find what your real policy is. We find what your real policy is on childcare, and that is you'll knock off the fee the relief. From Mayo. We find out what your real policy is on childcare. You'll knock off the fee relief and you're going to reduce the fee relief by the value of the rebate. In other words, you give $20 on the one hand and take it on the other. You're going to take away government, the growth in government centres and throw the whole lot to the private economy. In other words, all the mothers out there ought to know that they'll be ha being handled by private business in childcare, charging them about 100 a week, which you can now afford to give them $11.70. So they'll be charged $100 a week and you'll give them $11.70. Now, you haven't got, look, you haven't got a ghost of a show. Imagine you lot managing, you say there's a debt crisis. I mean, imagine you lot managing a crisis. Could you imagine it? I mean, you'd be just, you can't, you can't even manage yourself in this place, man, man, managing a crisis. And here you are, Order. you know, you've got, you're talking about the debt and the, the, the current account crisis, but when you get your big chance to really do something about it, what do you say? We'll have a weaker fiscal policy. We'll have a non-wage policy, a cave-in like the pilots with enterprise bargaining, and basically what we'll do, we'll screw interest rates up to 25 or 27 per cent to cut the heart out of inflation. I mean, in the end, you're the same dismal old, you're the same dismal, thoughtless old crowd that you were in 1981. You're back to the same policies as 1980-81. You just get in there, lift interest rates, 
destroy business and to try and destroy inflation. You haven't got a ghost of a show. This is not a policy. It's a sham. It's a joke. It has no macroeconomic structure. Andrew's laughing there. If the Prime Ministership was ever lifted on him, he would quake in his boots. Quake in his boots. He wants what he always wanted in life, a near victory. Andrew's best result is to nearly win. He loves to nearly win because winning carries responsibility and the one thing he shies off responsibility like Dracula from a wooden stake. He's run back that far from any Order. real responsibility. Mr Order. Speaker, the proposition's a joke, a joke and the Order. government will be opposing it. Order. Order. The time for the debate has expired. The question is that the motion be agreed to. All those of that opinion, please say aye. Those against, no. I think the noes have it. Division required. Ring the bells. Lock the doors. The question is that standing orders be suspended. I, the eyes will move to the right of the chair, the nose to the left. 
I appoint the honourable members for Wannan and Riverina Darling tell us for the eyes, and the honourable members for Macmillan and Streeton tell us for the nose. Order. The result of the division is eyes 55, nose 75. The division is resolved in the negative. Are there any further questions? Order. Will members quickly take their seats, please? Are there any further questions? The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Mr Speaker, my question is to the uh, Acting Prime Minister. I address the question to him, uh, noting the uh, unwillingness of the Treasurer to state uh, the government's policies on taxation. Could the Acting Prime Minister now indicate to the House what are the government's proposals to give tax relief to families 
and will he give a commitment on behalf of the government to return the proceeds of bracket creep to taxpayers? The Honourable the Treasurer. Mr Speaker. Order. Mr Speaker. Order. Mr Speaker. Mr. Speaker Honourable, uh, cease interjecting. I would have thought, Mr Speaker, that the Leader of the Opposition, who is suggesting that he has a, an understanding of policy, would know that right this moment, in this budget, from July the 1st, we are paying $5.7 billion worth of tax and family assistance. 5.7 paid now, this week. 20 to $30 a week, not on the never-never on a promise that can't be funded, that can't be funded. Because we didn't fund it. It's funded from a budget surplus. It's funded with a budget surplus. That's the kind of idiot remark. That's the kind of idiot remark we expect from Dr. Hewson and you. That talking about unfunded tax cuts, which are demonstrably funded, they're paid from a surplus. And the fact is, of the value of twenty to thirty dollars a week, compared to compared to the proposition you propose, which is two point five billion dollars, two point seven billion dollars which can't be funded by cuts in government spending, which has been demonstrated by the Finance Department, demonstrated and demonstrated convincingly by the Finance Department. As well as that, the government has, the government has indexed family allowances, increased family allowances and indexed them, and yet your front bench has refused to confirm that you would maintain the indexation on family allowances. That is, you will not maintain the commitment to keep the indexation on family allowances. We've increased the dependent spouse rebate and indexed that as well. And on top of that, of course, we've introduced the family allowance supplement. And the family allowance supplement will pay to a family on about 16 or 17,000 with three children about 5,000 a year free of tax. And you've got the temerity to be talking about family policy. I mean, what about all those families you put on the unemployment queues in 1981 and 82? Who were they? You think they were Martians? They Order. weren't. I suppose. Order. I suppose they weren't. Uh, well, the shadow treasurer was then the principal adviser in economic policy. A, a reasonably relevant point, wouldn't you say? A reasonably relevant point. And so, uh, what you did then was to put. Uh, uh, was to uh, lift unemployment to 650,000. That's 650,000 breadwinners out there placed into poverty with their families. And yet you put yourselves up as the sort of great protectors of families. I mean, what lean have you got over this area of policy? You've done nothing about it ever. Nothing about it ever. We're the only government ever came along with a decent income support scheme for families with a family allowance supplement. And then by increasing the family allowance and indexing it, well, give us a commitment on indexation. You won't give us a commitment on indexation of family allowances or the dependent spouse rebate. You won't give that commitment. But, but the puny, the puny nature, the puny nature of uh, your uh, your proposition is demonstrated in the scale which I published the other day, comparing the government's tax cuts and benefits to families. I'm just trying to dig it here out of this pile of paper, and I found it. Here it is. Here it is. Let me just give an example. That is. For a single income family with two children on 100% uh, of average weekly earnings, uh, the tax cuts and benefits under Labor, $24.30 a week. For the same family under you, $5.05. At 150% of average weekly earnings, $28.35 under us, $5.05 under you. Uh, now I'll go to the, the two income family, the two income family. On 100 per cent of average weekly earnings, the benefit under Labor for uh, one child is $18.55, under your proposition 15.15. At 150 per cent of average weekly earnings, it's $23.90 under us, under you 14.55. On, uh, on, uh, Mr. Mr. Uh, Speaker. Uh, Members on my left at will 200 cease percent, At 200 per cent, even at 200 per cent of average weekly earnings, it's $32.35 under us and $14.55 under you. Now, now, the fact of the matter, now, the thing is, that's, that's, with, that's giving you your full costings. That's giving you your full costing. Now, with 800 million out, this is what you can do. With 800 million out, 
At 100% of AWE, we provide to the single income family and two kids $24.30, you can provide $8.65. At 200 per cent of average weekly earnings, we can provide $31.05 and you can provide $8.65. And then for the two income family with one child, at 100 per cent of AWE, you can provide $18.55, we can provide $18.55 and you $5.45. And finally, Mr Speaker, at, at even the higher level, the in group you're interested in, at 200 per cent of AWE, for a two income family with one child, our proposition provides now, this week, $32.35, yours $4.80. Where's this so-called I mean, Order. where's your so-called great policy? Where's your policy? And, and the, the sheer arrogance of you saying you've got a family policy. I mean, the joke of it, that compared to these numbers which are being paid, which are being paid now. Which are being paid Order. now. If the members on my left will cease interjecting, which are being the paid, member for O'Connor, if you course, interject again, when, I will name when, you. And, and, and the, f the fact is, Mr. Uh, <clears throat> the Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Everyone over here knows. The uh, Minister for Social Security didn't draw breath for a time screaming and yelling, and you didn't even warn him. I didn't have, even call him to order. I have called people let alone on... issue something as you just have. I have so called... I want a bit of fairness both sides. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, the, the, uh, the Leader of the Opposition, I'm sure, isn't reflecting on the chair in that remark. And, and I will ensure that there is fairness on both sides. Reflection, will, that's a matter up to you. I, I wasn't. I will ensure... Uh, I that, just want a bit of fairness. That's I will all. ensure that there's fairness on both sides. And as you asked the question, I wanted to ensure that you hear the answer. The Honourable the Treasurer. Mr Speaker. Order. Mr Speaker. If you take, if you take it as a, as a yardstick, the single income family with two children, and you look at 150 per cent of average weekly earnings, are, are, are trying, to, trying to establish at least one, one substantial category of, of, of family in the community, we're paying them $28.35 a week. Now, now, you're, you would pay them $5.05, $5.05. But, but what gets me? You've got the temerity. You've got the temerity to say Order. you've got some virtue. And, Mr. Speaker, the fact of the matter is, given that the leader of the opposition walked away from his inflation adjustment proposal without even having the decency to put a line in his policy about it, just, just chickened out completely, chickened out, and walked away from the commitment, like he walked away from the gold tax commitment, like he walked away from the FBT commitment, what's this commitment worth? What's this five dollars worth? When would these people ever see that five dollars? They wouldn't have. You just say, look, we've come here and we've decided fiscal policy needs to be this or that, and I'm sorry, that's got to go by the wayside, just like inflation adjustment went by the wayside. I mean, the fact is, the fact of the matter is, you stand for nothing. Your promises are easily broken. They have no, they have no standing in in public terms, as you've demonstrated. But the fact is. Given that the government Order. is paying such an enormous benefit to families, the gall of you getting up saying you've got a family policy is just sick. Sick. The Honourable Member for the Northern Territory. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I address my question to the Minister for Social Security. Minister, since 1982-83, direct expenditure on family assistance has doubled to $3.5 billion. In 1987, the Family Allowance Supplement was introduced. In Order. April of this year, the government announced substantial increases to Family Allowance payments, yet there are claims, Minister, that the government has no policy for families. Would the Minister explain the government's approach and what alternatives, if any, have been offered or are offered? <coughs> the the Hon. Member for Farrah. The first two parts of that question were clearly a, a, a statement of fact. They were not in any shape or form a question or even background information for the purposes of the question and should be ruled out of order. The, the uh, member for the Northern Territory asked the minister for uh, a question about what was the government's approach to the matter. The question's in order. Uh, standing order 144 order. is quite clear, and uh, the honourable member was quite correct when he said the following uh, general rule shall apply to questions. Questions should not contain statements of facts. Now, that's what he just the, did in the, the earlier part, so you've got to rule him out of order. The, if, if the honourable uh, leader of the opposition 
and other members had have been listening to the question and and then they would have heard they would have heard that the honourable member for the Northern Territory made two points and then asked the minister for he asked the minister for the government's approach to this matter and as such that is in order the minister can reply to the question yes, do you have a further point of order a further point of order mr um, speaker under section 144 items prohibited um, include of course um, uh, matters of policy uh, it's uh, 144 part Two, which is B, to announce the government's policy. In other words, questions should not ask ministers for an expression of opinion to announce the government's policy. Order the, that's not what the question was. The question's in order. The minister will respond. But I, but I, I would hope that members aren't going to um, suggest that we should... Well, well then, I... I was being, I was, I'm, I take up the interjection of my colleague on the left here because I didn't intend to rule out of order the, some of the questions that are asked on both sides because I think the, uh, what the House wants is to ask questions and what the House wants is to receive information in response. The, uh, of course, it could have been suggested that the question of the Leader of the Opposition who asked what the Government's policy on a matter was could have been out of order. <coughs> Well, uh, I take a point of order on that because um, if, if, if you, Mr Speaker, are so thin-skinned as to interpret a question of mine as reflecting on you, I will now recount to you. If you are posing that, and I thought that uh, with your lack of experience you might be moved to do that, and I shall say to you that I consulted one of your advisers and uh, he uh, clearly indicated that it was in order. I therefore ask you to withdraw any imputation. I, I'm, I wasn't uh, suggesting any imputation to the Leader of the Opposition. In fact, I was suggesting what we want to do is get on with the business of the House of having, of having questions and having answers. The question was in order and the Minister will answer the question. Mr Speaker, um, I can understand that uh, the Opposition may not want to refer to a figure, the figure of $3.5 billion, because that figure mentioned uh, in the answer refers to a doubling of expenditure in relation to families that has occurred under this government. One can understand also that one wouldn't want from this opposition to hear comparisons, because what we've got uh, is a comparison between a policy, which I'll, understand, which I'll try and explain to the opposition, and what we've got uh, is a statement uh, of intention and on the basis of history uh, rather than uncertain intention. To go to the question of policy, as I understand it, the opposition, purports to want to help families. Well, in terms of the government, our assistance to families is based on policies. We believe there ought to be uh, uh, assistance uh, to families in terms of the social security system, and we believe that that assistance ought to meet objectives of equity, both to the lowest income families, and then, generally speaking, families ought to be assisted. We believe, uh, as a matter of policy, that that assistance uh, on the whole ought to be directed regularly uh, to the carer. We believe that uh, as a matter of policy that that uh, payment ought to be maintained in terms of its real value. We think as a matter of policy that uh, those payments to families, at least at the very high levels of income, ought to be income tested. We think as a matter of policy that those payments uh, ought to be tax free. And we believe, furthermore, that uh, those uh, payments to families ought to be augmented in certain cases of particular need to ensure that particularly low-income families receive additional assistance. Now, Mr Speaker, that policy has been spelled out, not as a vague matter of intention, but in some detail, in terms of a number of decisions. There are something like uh, one, <coughs> two million Australian families or about 3.8 million children who are receiving regularly assistance by virtue of family allowances. There are something like 500,000 families with 1.2 million children that are having that assistance augmented because they are in low income uh, families that need uh, additional assistance. But if I could go, uh, Mr Speaker, to the crux of the matter. And the difference uh, between policy 
as it's been spelled out by the government and what we've seen by way of, uh, of an intention as far as the opposition is concerned it is around the issue of indexation. If there is one difference between uh, what the government uh, has done, apart from the fact that it is fair, equitable, paid to the mother, paid regularly, is that it is indexed and will maintain its real value. Now, over and against that, we've got uh, uh, the alternative that's been suggested of a rebate, not paid until uh, some time late in 1991, not reflecting in any sense uh, any assessment of need, not paid to the carer, not paid regularly when it is really needed, and in fact an intention which is simply for the purpose of putting a line, a billion dollars, a billion dollars, put that line in terms of uh, some statement, but spell out what it means in terms of the needs of particular families or work out what it means in terms of uh, a particular uh, policy that integrates with the needs of the whole range of families, and you'll see nothing about that. And until we see, uh, uh, Mr Speaker, uh, some indication in terms of specifics, then I think we're inclined to, uh, as I'm sure most people in Australia will do, wipe these words as being a mere vague intention that certainly won't be paid for and will never be implemented. The Honourable Member for Wentworth. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Treasurer. How does the Treasurer propose to fund the recent government commitments to compensate Kodak, compensate the airlines and compensate four major banks? What is the total cost of these commitments on the Commonwealth budget? including the cost of revenue foregone. The Honourable Treasurer. Uh, Mr Speaker, we made these uh, estimates known at the time uh, when uh, the, bank, the, bank, uh, the bank issue was uh, made public, uh, which, was, uh, which, will, which will diminish reserve bank profits and which will have a, a part year effect next financial year, not this financial year. It will have no impact on this year's budget whatsoever. And given the fact that we are halfway through the year, we'll go and look up the press release, old pal. I'm not here. I'm not your research officer, um, uh, Mr. Mr. Speaker, um, uh, and that's uh, halfway through next year's halfway through this year, which will reflect in next year's profit uh, profit performance and payment to the budget. Oh, Order. give it away, will you, for God's sake, Mr. Order. Mr. Speaker? Uh, paid to the uh, government in next year's uh, in next year's budget. Uh, as, as far as the pilots are concerned, I think. To, if I'm relying on my memory, but the costs so far of the budget are about $30 million, about $30 million in a budget of $90,000 million, uh, in a, uh, in a uh, surplus of uh, $9.1 billion. Of course, unlike the rest of you, last year we had a budget surplus of just on $6 billion. This year we've made it nine. But I could have said to my colleagues, look, there's $3 billion here. Let's, let's have a spend up like the coalition wants to do. Let's make fiscal policy a bit weaker. Let's not add to the surplus. Let's, let's, let's have a spend up. Yes, we spent it on the surplus. Three billion of it went onto the surplus. And you might ask why we thought, why we showed the responsibility of putting on the surplus and you didn't? Because we're conscientious about the national economic condition. That's why. And we're not about, we're not about, we're not about doing the shabby liberal uh, thing of trying to buy votes uh, in the way in which you, which you did. Uh, in relation to Kodak, uh, Mr. Uh, Speaker, that matter is yet to be finally negotiated between Kodak and Senator Button, and the costs, whatever the costs will be, will be costs which are incurred at some point in the future, which may have some small effect on this year's budget. If the point you're trying to make is these have, uh, they're having bit of big effects on this year's budget, one so far is worth $30 million, the other would be part of that. It would be a very small part of a $9,100 million surplus, but an even smaller part of a $90,000 million budget. But of course, what really amuses me is that you've got the hide to ask the question. When you've brought a policy down yourself, when you have the option of cutting expenditure and adding it to the surplus, and you decide to cut expenditure and spend it. And spend it. Oh yes, well, you're up there before saying, oh, we'll add $5. Well, the government's providing $28 a week to that single income, two child family, and you big fellas, you, you'll put five dollars on it. Oh, what, what an unbelievable social change. What an unbelievably, what, an, what, an, what, what a, a breath-defying social change that is. That you'll actually put five dollars on top of the government's 28 and then invest yourself with a great family title, you humbugs. 
<laughs> you humbugs. Now, Mr. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, we know about the former treasurer's fiscal record. He left. He and the, and the then treasurer left me with a deficit of just on 9.6 billion dollars. And we've been cutting outlays for seven years, Order. for seven years, and we've now got a surplus which we've added this year three billion dollars to, three billion dollars to six last year, nine this year. But when the test came for you, you said, "No, we won't add any. What we'll do is we'll spend it." And then, and then, just to add insult to injury, you've made it clear in briefing the journalists that the twin deficit linkage doesn't matter anyway that public savings don't matter. The fiscal surplus doesn't matter because enhanced public saving means diminished private saving. And so what's the point? Well, this is the line you're pushing, a line which is not part of the consensus in financial markets worldwide, not part of the OECD consensus, the IMF consensus or the consensus in Australia. This is, this is the Liberal Party saying fiscal policy doesn't matter. And you've proved it by spending the cuts that you would otherwise make in government expenditure. You've proved it, that you've got no premium on fiscal policy. And that's the point I've been making. You've got no premium on fiscal policy. You've got no wage policy. So guess what cops the load? Interest rates, monetary policy. And you'd go then, if 20 per cent is only slowing the economy, what's it going to do to eliminate inflation, as you suggest? Here you are, you're saying, the next coalition government will conduct monetary policy with a medium-term objective of reducing and eventually eliminating inflation. If 20 is just slowing the economy, what interest rate eliminates inflation? 30? 27? I mean, what guess over 20 actually reduces and eliminates inflation? 25? 27? 30? Because your fiscal policy is weak. You've made that clear. Your wages policy is a cave-in. You've been up here for six, seven weeks now telling us to give in to the pilots. I mean, you don't have a policy. So, so don't ask. Don't, don't get up. Don't get up trying to ask me. To, don't get up trying to ask me, please. Order, order. Try, don't get up trying to ask me a pathetic, weak little question about whether thir thirty million dollars is going to weaken a fiscal surplus of nine billion. That thirty million dollars is going to weaken a fiscal surplus of nine billion when you've been running around telling people the twin deficits theory doesn't matter. I mean, you're a joke in financial markets. A lot of you. The Honourable Member for Ford. My question is directed to the Minister for Community Services and Health and Concerns Child Care. What has been the extent of the expansion of child care under the present government and what commitments has the government made to further expansion of child care places? Is the emphasis primarily on the public sector and would the government support any proposals to limit access to the public sector or to cut fee relief for families. The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, I thank the Honourable Member for Ford uh, for her question, and uh, I'd point out first of all that uh, under this government, the number of childcare places have risen from 46,000 in 1983 to 114,000 a day, the most massive achievement by any Commonwealth government in this country's history, and we have a commitment to expand those by a further, further 30,000. We see the public sector as central to this provision, just as, in fact, in education, we see the public school systems of this country as central to that provision. We have no plans whatsoever to limit the access of middle-income families to government-provided childcare, and we see the fee relief structure as central to the provision of uh, those places. Now, of course, all of those things are under challenge if one is to read the article in the Sydney Morning Herald yesterday. Now, Order. <coughs> the member for McKellar. I want to say that, uh, first of all, that the uh, member for Bradfield is an intelligent member of the opposition, <laughs> and and in that article, in that article, <coughs> and in that article, he presented the most coherent, the most comprehensive account we've yet had of Liberal National Party childcare. Indeed, it's much more comprehensive, much more coherent than anything we've had for the Shadow Minister for uh, childcare, that's the Honourable Member for Dawson, and certainly it is much more co comprehensive and uh, much more coherent than anything we've had from the Leader of the Opposition. But even more important, even more important, 
what the Honourable Member for Bradfield did was to spell out the inherent logic of the, government, of the opposition's proposals. The inherent logic of those proposals. And even if uh, the Leader of the Opposition uh, tries to fudge the issue, tries to deny some of them, if you look, if you look at what the Honourable Member for Bradfield said, they are the inherent logical outcomes of the policy. And just look at what he said, look at the denials, and see what, in fact, they mean. First of all, he said, and he's quoted, quoted, I am not going to be held to the government's proposed 30,000 new public places, which is different to ours. That is, the opposition are saying they are not, the opposition, the opposition are saying that they are not going to be committed to those 30,000 places. They're not making that commitment. Now I know that uh, the Honourable Member for Bradfield has, to deny, has had to deny that he said that, and uh, the Leader of the Opposition has said that he's wrong, but what is clear is that in the Liberal policy, public expansion is to end. Now it mightn't end in their first year of government, it mightn't end in their second year, but they have made it perfectly clear that they want a privatised system of childcare. That is an end to further public expansion. We are saying, and all the figures we have, we will not just need the 30,000 new public places throughout the 90s. We are going to have to provide further public places in childcare. But that commitment, that commitment is now ended, however opportunistically, the exact point of time that public uh, provision will come to an end. Then, of course, uh, Mr Connolly told us yesterday that uh, a coalition, under a coalition go government, middle-income families would not be allowed into government childcare centres. Now, I'm not quite sure whether that proposal has been denied, but if you are only going to produce a small component of public places, then obviously those places are just going to be kept for the poor and less well-off. That is, you will not be able to allow middle-income families and their children access to those centres. Now, we oppose that policy on two clear grounds. One, there are enormous advantages, enormous advantages in having a good social mix in your childcare centres. That, in fact, you don't just concentrate the children of the poor or low-income earners. That is, you have a good social mix. And secondly, as I shall point out in a moment, where would those middle-income families take their children if they're excluded from public centres? Now, can I return to the two fundamental points again? Unless this government continues its fee relief expansion, then you will not provide places for middle and low income people in childcare in this country. If the opposition come in with a policy to end fee relief, and they've said we mightn't end it next year, but it's going to be put to an end because we're going to rely on this rebate, the result of that will there be many thousands of middle income... Order, the leader, order. Of, the the leader of the opposition... On uh, point now, order. the minister on the previous occasion that he whipped that last remark in, lowered his voice, and I missed what he said. And he did it again. What he said, said it would, such funding would, would end, and he dropped his voice in saying something to the effect that we have said that we would end this public funding. What, what's the now, point now, this answer is predicated on a lie, and he keeps whipping in this lie, and I ask him to uh, desist from it, because order, what order. he's doing there's, there's, there's is no, propagating from no information which is incorrect. There's no, there's no point of order. The Honourable Minister. Speaker, the point I have made is not that uh, fee relief would end, that the expansion of fee relief would end. And the point is that unless you have a con continuing expanding fee relief segment, because of the very cost of childcare, you will make it unaffordable, you will deny access to low income and middle income families. Now, of course, what the opposition says is that, of course, it won't matter because we'll give it over to the free market, there'll be these extra rebates, and lots of childcare centres will jump up all over the place. That is not going to occur, because you, unless you get substantial fee relief monies, unless parents are given a pretty substantial amount of support, then it is very unlikely that there'll be many more childcare centres. Indeed, the only place they will be, the only place they will occur will be in those wealthier suburbs of our country. Just as when we had an open system of benefit for nursing homes, where did we get the nursing homes? In the eastern suburbs of Melbourne, in the north shore suburbs of Sydney, in the eastern hillside suburbs of Adelaide. That is, 
If you leave it open to the system suggested by the opposition, then inevitably you may get a few new childcare centres, but they'll be in those areas where you've got your wealthier segments of the population, just as you had with uh, nursing home. And if you only have to look at the provision of nursing homes across this country in the 70s and early 80s, which we have changed. So let me come back. Unless the opposition rethink its policy on childcare, unless they give A, a central place to fee relief as a critical part, or secondly, provide their continuing commitment to public expansion, then you'll put childcare in this country back a generation. The Honourable Leader of the National Party. Thank, thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Treasurer. Why has the government committed $150 million of taxpayers' funds to the waterside uh, workers' redundancy payments when the waterside workers' federal secretary, Mr Taz Bull, has specifically refused to give guarantees of productivity improvements? The Honourable Treasurer. <coughs> Mr Speaker, I should have thought uh, my colleague answered the, these points very adequately uh, a week or so ago. But the, <coughs> the, obvious, the obvious point is there are automatic productivity improvements if you have the same job being done by 2,000 fewer people. Oh, that's rubbish, is it? Well, oh, well, that's rubbish. Oh, okay, okay, Order. Mr. Speaker. Here we are. Order. Here we are. We let's remember this: that this system of this system of employment in the waterside, in the waterfront, was the result of 30 years of coalition policy. All of these, <coughs> all of these practices, were there under 30 years of coalition policy. <coughs> you had a seven-year run up to 1983. And you had a 23-year run up to, up to 1972. And you never regarded it <coughs> as a big issue then. <coughs> but all of a sudden, it's become the holy grail. It's the big thing. You see, it's the one great thing that's going to decide everything. But it was never a, such an issue that you would ever change it. You, in fact, you, in fact well, here's the world champions and conveyancer with another, uh, with a, with another, with another witticism. Um, uh, Order. Uh, Mr Speaker. Uh, they never had either the wit or the courage to do anything about it, about, about employment, about, uh, uh, about enterprise employment on the waterfront, to move away from pooling, to do something about the uh, numbers on the waterfront, or indeed with coastal shipping. And yet it's fallen to this government to, to do both, that is to dramatically change the level of employment on the waterfront, to improve the efficiency of the waterfront and to move towards enterprise employment, that kind of... Uh, the, the change in the nature of employment which will allow training and a commitment to increases in productivity as mechanisation and training improve the performances of our waterfront. Oh, look, you, look you've never had a policy. Party. You've asked the question. You've never had a policy. Your lot have been around for that long. I, remember when, I, I can remember when I first came here, your former leader was Minister for Shipping and Transport then, and then Peter Nixon was Minister for Shipping. What did you ever do with the job? Nothing. You never did anything with it. It's only us, as usual. We're always the people that have got to make all the changes in Australia, as we've done on this occasion. It's the same with coastal shipping. As a result of uh, my colleagues' reforms, we'll end up with OECD manning levels on Australian ships. What did you the ever do about it? Party what will did you ever do about it? What did you ever do about it? Nothing. And what would you do? What would you do now without an agreement on the waterfront? If you said, "Oh, look, what we'll do is we'll just abolish a couple more thousand, or we'll do." The, the enterprise union number and, and you had enormous stoppages on the water, what would you do? What would you do? I mean, you'd do what you did, what you did with the pilots. That's what you do, like you did with the pilots, where you're advocating a cave-in, where you're advocating a cave-in over, over six weeks. So, Mr. Mr Speaker, the productivity benefits are just completely self-evident. It's the same task as if they're being performed. Well, look, I mean, it's not a matter of argument, Order. it's a matter of common sense. If the same task is being performed by 2,000 fewer people, there's obviously a very dramatic lift in productivity. And if you can't see that, your rational capability is in worse shape than even I think it is. The Honourable Member for MacArthur. My question is also addressed to the Treasurer. Has the Treasurer's attention been drawn to a report suggesting the most effective way of reducing interest rates in Australia would be to implement a decentralised wage-fixing system? If so, what are the implications of this for monetary policy and inflation? The Honourable Treasurer. Mr Speaker, Mr. Speaker I have, uh, I have uh, seen references to such, uh, such uh, policy and changes uh, in the Liberal National Party's economic action plan. And it says two things about 
those particular topics. In relation to wages, it says this. A major ingredient of our approach is that employers and employees who choose to do so can negotiate voluntary agreements on wages and conditions of employment at the enterprise level, outside the system at the enterprise level. And then on inflation, under monetary policy, it says, by reducing inflation and shifting the weight off monetary policy, we will be able to bring about a sustained reduction in interest rates. Now, when questioned about this, how would inflation be reduced, shifting the weight off monetary policy, not onto monetary policy, but off monetary policy, the answer from the shadow treasurer was that under our wages system, the one I just read out, wages will fall. That will produce a great leap down in wages. Now, in other words, we go to an enterprise bargain, the economy is growing along like it is now. All of a sudden we go to an enterprise bargaining. There's no accord, there's no ACTU, there's no Bill Kelty, there's no fireman. And you go there, there's no one to help you, there's just enterprise agreements. And you go to these enterprise agreements and all of a sudden wages are going to leap down. Wages are going to leap down. And as they leap down, that reduces then inflation. That then reduces inflation and because inflation's down, the interest rates will come down. Well, look, no one in the world would write rubbish like this. Oh. No one in the world would write rubbish like this. And the interesting thing is, one wouldn't mind, Mr Speaker, if we didn't have in the, this very parliament within the last month the exact classic example of enterprise bargaining, with the two enterprises, ANSAT and Australian Airlines, being, being preyed upon by the pilots for a 30 per cent increase. And, and, and the Leader of the Opposition urging the government to cave in on that is the Neville Chamberlain of Australian industrial relations, the great industrial appeaser, the craven appeaser of Australian industrial Order. relations, Order. urged the government for seven weeks to cave in to a 20 per cent plus wage claim. But, but no, no, under his policies wages will just go down. You see, you see, if we'd, if, there, if we'd have had a Liberal government, when the pilots put their claim in, they wouldn't have gone for 30, they would have gone for minus five or minus six. <laughs> now, that, that's, that's what you've got in this. It's pathetic. You see, I mean, could you imagine, could you imagine a major political party publishing tripe like this? Could you, could you imagine it? Look, at your worst days, when Malcolm was around trying to, trying to trick himself into office, he would never have been guilty of this kind of rubbish by reducing inflation and shifting the weight off monetary policy. Now, Mr, Mr, Mr. Speaker, the shadow treasurer has talked about nothing since, he has been, since he's been in this parliament about, other than putting the weight on monetary policy. He's never spoken about anything but putting the weight on monetary policy. He's been saying how the government's tricking up interest rates. We've not run a decent monetary policy. We've been politicising the Reserve Bank. We've been not, not been putting weight on monetary policy. All of a sudden, his document comes out and he's taking the weight off, off monetary policy. Not on, off, off monetary policy. And then, and then, Mr. Speaker, then, Mr. Speaker, when the Leader of the Opposition's questioned about how, how a requirement to hold wages down would, entire, and, and would imply a tighter monetary policy with high employment, what does he answer? Oh, there'll be no unemployment, he says. There'll be no unemployment with higher interest rates, which brought a horse laugh from everyone on the panel, on face to face, which brought a horse laugh from face to face. If it wasn't for the proprieties of television journalism, they would have laughed you off the set when you said, when you said that you could have a draconian monetary policy without any lift in unemployment. So, I mean, I mean is, it any, is it any wonder? No, the people who have been lost, you've lost business. Oh, you've no. lost Australian business because they the, know what all this means. They know order, that if you the, go the, to order, another... There is far too much noise in the chamber. The member for Mayo, the member for Lowe, members on my right, the Honourable the Treasurer, the Leader of the Opposition will cease it ejecting too. The, well, we might just wait till there's some. We might just wait for a moment or two. Mr Speaker, the, Honourable the, Treasurer. the employers of this country know that if they go to an enterprise bargain facing a craft union or unions coming at them outside of an accord structure, they'll be cut to pieces and that wages will go up, not down. Wages will go up, not down. Will go up, not down. 
And the idea then that we'd end up with lower inflation, which would lower the inflationary floor under interest rates, is the greatest load of codswallop that's ever been spoken by a major political party. And that's the, that's the basic essence of your policy. Because the spending things are one thing. We can all have a debate about the tax expenditures, but the essence of your policy about how you would run the economy is that you would get a wage fall out of a bargaining system which would then reduce inflation and that would reduce interest rates. Well, as I used to say, tell it to the Marines. The Honourable Member for Ryan. Point of order, the Honourable Member Lord Bendigo. Speaker, I'd like to draw to your attention, uh, during the Treasurer's answer, then a uh, consistent barrage of interjections which were being made by the well. opposition advisor. Order. Order. The Honourable Member for Bendigo. By the, by the opposition advisers, and I believe that that's not within the standing orders, I'd like to draw that to your attention for, uh, for ruling and perhaps advice to the advisers that they should not be interjecting in that way during the passage of the House. Well, I, I wasn't aware of that, but I might... Uh, how, however, however, how, however, people... Obviously, members on my left don't want question time to continue. If you might let me just finish. People in the galleries on either side should not uh, partake in the debate, and if they do so on either side, will be removed from the chamber. The Honourable Member for Ryan. Well, we've got nothing to worry about. Mr uh, Speaker, uh, my, uh, my question is directed to the Treasurer while he's telling good stories. Of the 12 major government business enterprises listed for privatisation by the Coalition, which include Australian Airlines, Qantas, the domestic and international airport terminals, OSAT, the Commonwealth Bank, the Australian National Line, among others, Will the Treasurer tell us which of these the government has plans to privatise? Oh, yes, we have. Why won't we have? The Honourable the Treasurer. Mr. Uh, Mr. Speaker, the, the notion that, uh, which is implied in the opposition policy is that some change in the level of uh, some change in the ownership of government assets would imply a dramatic change in uh, in the economy and particularly a dramatic change in the level of interest rates. The fact of the matter is, it's nonsense, because all we end up with, Mr. Mr. Uh, order the member for Ryan on a point of order. That uh, wasn't the question. The question was what plans they might order, have. Order. There is no point of order, and the member for Ryan knows yes, it. Misunderstood the question. The honourable because, treasurer. Mr. Speaker, it is. It becomes a very marginal macro. It's order. a very marginal macroeconomic issue. For, order. The treasurer might resume his seat. The member for Flinders will cease interjecting. I warn the honourable member for Mayo, <laughs> the treasurer. Well, the idiot son of the establishment. You've got to take pity on him, Mr. Uh, Mr. Speaker. Um, uh, I mean, lightning never strikes in the same place twice. You know, we've got all of the former, the former stars of the Menzies cabinet, and they've got their offspring here. You know, dwindling away, dying away on the back bench, Mr. Uh, Mr. Um, Mr. Speaker, uh, Mr. Speaker, the issue is the issue is simply this: that instead of instead of issuing government securities, we'd be issuing private securities. It makes no difference to the level of interest rates. It makes a marginal influence, a marginal change on macroeconomic policy. This is something I have always said, whether they are sold or sold, whether they are sold or not. Now, whether the government will decide to sell any one or all of these bodies uh, will be a matter for judgment over time. And that um, we have already sold a number of uh, private, a number of uh, government assets <coughs> into the private economy, but we've done them for reasons other than believing that will have some effect on interest rates. It will have none. But this is what's implied in your, uh, in your policy, that it's going to in introduce a major, a major microeconomic change which is going to have macroeconomic influences. Well, the fact is, it just simply won't. The Honourable Member for Hughes. Mr Speaker, my question is addressed to the Minister for Social Security. And I ask, I ask have the numbers of people on unemployment benefits for nine months or longer been reducing every year since 1984. Uh, I ask uh, what action the government has taken to achieve this result 
and how the government's approach differs from alternative approaches to the issue of unemployment. The Honourable Minister for Social Security. <laughs> well, I don't think there's any reason at all uh, that uh, why the government should go easy on the question of uh, unemployment benefits. After all, that's been an area in which we've seen the effect of government's uh, policies uh, in each year, certainly since 1984, the numbers on benefit have fallen from uh, 635,000 to now 363,000. Uh, under every category of duration, under three months, three months to six months, six months to nine months, over nine months, over five years, in every category of duration, numbers are now falling. Now, of course, this has been achieved uh, through an approach uh, that uh, the honourable leader of the opposition, who prattles, wouldn't understand. That is an approach which is sophisticated, involves uh, 1.5 million jobs, 1.5 million jobs, uh, so that uh, unemployment has been reduced as a result of uh, very successful program of job creation. Well, I was surprised that you would interject. After all, you weren't involved in the policy, you weren't consulted, you didn't get the fingers wrong, and when you came in, you were, you were, you were uh, repudiated. <laughs> the uh, second uh, thrust of the government's policy has been in terms of uh, education and training uh, policy, and we've sought to ensure that as that job uh, creation occurs, as those jobs are created, those that are most disadvantaged uh, have uh, been able to take up the various positions. And I don't think that uh, we've ever had, in terms of an integrated uh, labour market uh, policy linked to social security, a more successful policy that has resulted in uh, uh, tens of thousands of people each year moving from benefit uh, into the workforce. And of course, the third uh, element uh, of the policy has been to ensure that uh, we run, uh, from a social security point of view, a tight system. That is, that we administer unemployment benefit uh, fairly and effectively. Now, of course, uh, one only needs to go back to 1982, where we see the opposition at the time abolishing the work test, removing the requirement to personally lodge continuation of benefit reforms forms, and remove the requirement for registration at the Commonwealth Employment Service. And if you look on the social security side and you look uh, to measures that have been introduced by this government to ensure that uh, there is no leakage in relation to unemployment benefit that is paid to those uh, who are actively seeking work, uh, then of course you can see that in terms of the range of benefits that have been introduced. The reintroduction of registration with the employment service, the requirement to lodge fortnightly, the uh, introduction of employer separation certificates. Uh, the uh, comprehensive uh, documentation of work efforts uh, each fortnight, the interviewing of long-term beneficiaries, the uh, uh, introduction through the New Start program of joint uh, interviews with the CES uh, and Social Security. So the result has been that through uh, uh, job creation, through integrated labour market uh, program efforts and through uh, a system run incredibly laxly by the opposition, indeed by Fred Cheney, who is Minister for Social Security. We've seen a system run tightly and effectively, and the result has been that massive reduction in terms of the number of benefits. Now, I just simply make the point, and I end on this point, Mr Speaker, uh, and it's simply this, that uh, the opposition have had seven years to have a look at what the government has been doing in terms of administration of unemployment benefit, the links with CES and so on that after seven years and a much vaunted policy, when you look at the substance of the policy, the substance of, well, you just get back to your Ferraris, Fred. Uh, when you have a look at uh, their policy, you see there's not a single new idea, not a single new idea. All they want to do is move from a tight work-tested benefit to one that, uh, that uh, isn't administered and cannot be administered in anything like a comparable, rigorous way. The Honourable the Acting Prime Minister. Right, uh, the <laughs> Honourable Member for Reid.